So, folks, I'm here with Brian Matlack, and he is running for the U.S. Senate in Kansas. Now, Brian, um, I want you to introduce yourself to our viewers. But from what I understand, you are a socialist. You are a critic of capitalism, but you are not running as a Democrat. You are running in the Republican primary. Can you tell us more about yourself? Yeah, my name is Brian Matlock. I'm an economics PhD student and teach economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Uh, it's a kind of socialist leaning program. And uh, this year, I sort of took a leave of absence to run for U.S. Senate as a Republican socialist in the state of Kansas. Um, so from Idaho originally and uh, have lived in red states my whole life and just think a lot of the kind of small town communitarian ethic that a lot of working class Republicans have has things in common that we can build off of and so kind of am, have no interest in moving people through centrist corporate Democrats to get towards uh, progressive politics. I think there's a lot of things that we can build off from the get go. And so that's what I'm trying to do here in Kansas. Well, let me ask you, are you socially conservative? I am not. Okay. Uh, uh, basically, I try to look at some of the the underlying issues like when it comes to guns a lot of socialists have traditionally had similar uh types of like well the government shouldn't be able to disarm the working class or things like that um and the gun issue represents a lot of issues like uh, mental health and suicide and uh accidents and public safety and all sorts of different issues tied up in one and so i think if you kind of break it down and try to see what's the the best way to address like the ability of the populace to arm themselves against a tyrannical government, uh, you know, you can also look at things that like, well, maybe we should look at the other side of that equation and demilitarize the police force. But um, it, essentially, you need to address the root underlying issues. But I'm sort of uh, a lot more like open to people owning guns and second amendment type of stuff uh just think that we shouldn't have like profiteering gun companies politicizing it for their own benefit etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, um as far as like um lgbtq and marriage equality like i'm inclusive and uh think that we should protect everyone's rights which i think um at least portions of the libertarians and others within the Republican Party have like kind of a laissez-faire like government shouldn't be involved in those type of issues. And so um, I don't know, I think, yeah, there's coalitionable so, elements. But So what in your platform do you think appeals to Republicans? Yeah, so uh, a lot of Working class Republicans, when they hear the word socialist, they have in mind that it means like you get free stuff from the government, which is sort of ironic given that socialism has always been a movement of workers, like and of and it has often been against people like uh Rontier's land landlords, people who aren't contributing things, getting a big cut of everyone else's work. And so it's sort of like the value of work and our ability to contribute. Like if you look at libertarian socialist theories uh, and critiques of uh, the welfare state period and some of the like kind of paternalistic ways in which they're, okay, let's give a bare subsistence to people in distressed communities, but then continue policies that make it unable to have a viable constructive way forward. And so uh, looking at the way, how do we actually empower communities and um, trying to shift the narrative? It's not like we want big government to take care of us. It's like we know what our needs are. We want to get to work and do those things together. And so things like uh, the worker cooperative model where workers 
own the companies and have democratic control of companies, like a lot of people in small towns, they distrust big corporations just as much as big government. It's they know they come in, they put out a, local businesses, and then they sort of play communities against each other for tax abatements and other sorts of uh, funding. And they're very predatory. They don't care about your people. They uh, suck out the money and the profits. And so the sort of like localism and bottom up and the get to work things, I think um, local worker cooperatives and workplace democracy seem to resonate with people as well as a job guarantee as a program as a that's locally administered. And so there's an element of it where more control is put into local hands. And we can see that in this pandemic. Uh, as we reopen, if they're super high, lots of businesses closing because they haven't been able to pay rent because they don't have money. Um, the issue won't be there's not enough work to go around. The issue will be... Uh, like the money isn't in places to put people to work. So having a program where we can put people to work doing the things that are important to us, but a portion of that discretionary money is in the hands of community members. Like um, participatory budgeting is another thing that's been uh, very popular often. Discretionary funds in a local like city's budget has a democratic control over it instead of the... Um, city councilor getting to decide where to allot this slush fund. It's the people get to say, what are our priorities? How much do these different things cost? We vote, uh, set those priorities. We can do that with jobs so that, uh, because anytime there's unemployment, there's so much work to be done. Uh, it can be either in care work, education, taking care of the elderly, planting trees, fixing infrastructure. Like there's sort of immense amounts of uh, things that we can art. Um, and so a lot of the, the sort of value of work, of taking care of each other, of having more local control and input, um, I think those things tend to resonate with them a lot more than uh, what they think of as socialism as this sort of like paternalistic welfare, bare subsistence, uh, but it, you know, um, look at the era in communities of color, it, uh, like when there was the welfare, it's like, sure, it helped them survive, but all of the, there was still the redlining, there was the white flight, there were all of the things that sort of like a very unequal education system, which we still have, that's funded by property taxes, which benefits the wealthy and hurts so it's like as people move out, then it just like the system collapses on itself. Um, and so it's not just about like allowing people to survive, which sure, like I don't want people to starve. Like I'd rather them survive on a subsistence check. But also more than any of that, I would allow them to have the ability to make decisions and build a way forward for their communities. And so um so sort of like looking at the more like uh, just because my background was sort of in community development and participatory development, a lot of those things came from like radical socialist, uh, libertarian socialists, like doing this kind of bottom up um, participate, developing these participatory methods. And a lot of those things, like in their nonprofit forms, conservatives really get behind. They're like, oh, yeah, teach a person to fish instead of giving them, uh, like, you can frame it however you want. But um, I think as people um, participate in that, uh, and then I think emphasizing the sort of value of, um, personal ethics and of relationships and things like that, because at least in the community I grew up in, it was, it wasn't like a, like, Oh, I don't want anyone receiving any help. It was like people who were often caring for, you know, like my parents took in several kids who weren't their own. They were, they take care of uh, like my grandma and were like constantly helping her out and stuff like that. And I even, uh, Okay. Took a semester well, off of school to. No, go well, let me ask you, um, where are you on foreign policy, right? Because the U.S. Senate, I mean, the, there's a lot of foreign, foreign issues that you would have to take a stand on. Are you for uh, reviving the Iran nuclear deal? 
Uh, yeah, generally speaking, yeah, I'm. Uh, I think we need to avoid uh, war, obviously, as much as possible, and economic sanctions often hurt the most vulnerable and not necessarily the regimes uh, who um, we want to change. So um, I I think as much as possible, like the people are suffering and like, uh, yeah, and, go ahead. And for Venezuela too, you'd be in favor of like lifting the sanctions on Venezuela and stopping US efforts to destabilize Venezuela? Absolutely. Um, I think it definitely wasn't perfect. And Chavez, uh, he's quite the character. Uh, back in the day, I lived in Venezuela for a summer. I was working on my Spanish. And uh, uh, he was on the TV constantly, kind of a just a big personality Trumpish, in my opinion. Uh, I'm doing the same thing Christ was doing, multiplying the bread. Uh, but he sort of bet the economy on the oil price and uh, they don't have their own, you know, all these problems. But then we provide these sanctions, which just sort of like squelch any chance of their economy reviving. And it's, it's very heavy handed. It is not, it just like, I think seriously hurts like the country's long-term prospects and their relationship with us. And um, to this point has just like, it hasn't been successful and it's been very destructive. Like I, I think we could have a more friendly and supportive uh, role. I, I, I just don't think regime change was a, it's a, like, just look at the track record in Central and South America. It's not worked out well for us. Well, and, let me uh, ask you. What do you think of Trump and how he's trying to blame China for the pandemic and say that it's all China's fault uh, that we're having all these problems over here? I mean, I I honestly feel like both uh, both parties are very destabilized by this. They want to figure out how to politically capitalize uh, how to politically capitalize on it and don't know how, and they'll kind of say whatever. China did the same thing as us in a lot of ways. They uh, didn't want it to hurt the economy, didn't want to acknowledge how big of a, or have people panic, and so they uh, suppressed it for a while, which is the same thing Trump did. He was like, oh, it's fine, economy, economy. But then eventually he's like, oh, it turns out this is a real problem. And it's, I don't know, I think um, it's sort of, shouldn't be taken too seriously anything he's like whatever he's going to say he's going to want to figure out how to get reelected whatever the democrats are going to say they're trying to get re uh, they're trying to take power so you buy into the idea we should be very afraid of russia that russia is coming to get us uh that you know uh that we should be terrified we should be going after any politician that looks like they might have ties to russia we should be suppressing russian media outlets like what's your stand on that I mean, um, like, I don't love the meddling they've done, but also it's uh, hypocritical <laughs> uh, because U.S. is one of the most notorious actors in terms of, uh, like, influencing other people's elections. And so I uh, would especially what, like to see it. What do you describe? I, I don't I don't I mean, I, the charges have been dropped against the Internet Research Agency. Um, you know, the Mueller report showed no collusion. So I don't know. I don't know what you're referring to there. But why don't we move on? Um, um, let me ask you, you know, um, you know, Israel has a lot of influence in the Republican Party, um, you know, and I, 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 I'm sure that a lot of the people in Kansas are, you know, are deeply, deeply evangelical folks who really admire Israel. Are you a supporter of Israel? Um, I am. A supporter of all people, and uh, I believe that in this conflict, uh, currently Israel has more power for a variety of reasons, and I believe that uh, the their policy towards Palestine has been very, uh, I don't know, apartheid. It's been, uh, I don't know. So I. Uh, believe that they need to change their policy. Like, I obviously care about the Israeli people and their future, but um, I cannot support their 
uh, policy approach towards Palestine and uh, believe we need a humanizing uh, path forward. So, well, let me ask you um, also about uh, about I guess moving moving to your campaign. What do you think your campaign is going to look like? Like, who are you going to be speaking to? What kind of groups do you think would would give you an endorsement and give you support uh, in your campaign in Kansas? Well, um, I believe that a lot of organizations that uh, I'm like the Democrats are running kind of a corporate mainstream who has no policy platform whatsoever. And uh, the Republicans that I'm running against are all running on a very pro-Trump agenda. So my hope is that some of the like I call them good neighbor Republicans, like more working class folks who care about like treating each other well, helping out your neighbors, things like that, who don't love the Trump regime will be uh, interested in helping out as well as progressives who feel abandoned by the uh, uh, pro corporate Democrats who aren't really wanting to make healthcare on uh, immigration on anything. Uh, also, immigrants in the Latin American community, because again, the other candidates have not been doing a lot of outreach. So, well, and let me ask you also, what are the big issues in Kansas? Like, I know these tariffs on China that Trump has escalated have really hit the farming sector, right? A lot of farmers are suffering because of that, right? Absolutely. Can you talk about yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. And so just in general, Kansas is one of the highest states without migration. Uh, we've been hit pretty hard by globalizations uh, and the takeover of corporate farming. And th and so a lot of really struggling rural communities. So I think they're going to, I mean, right now, most obviously this campaign uh is going to be a lot about like wh how do we get the economy back on track? Like it went to the economy wasn't that important relative to healthcare and immigration stuff like that. Now um, I think as we start opening up and we realize how bad the damage is, uh, the economy is going to shoot from kind of low on the list at the beginning of this election cycle to very high on the list. So probably economy and uh, healthcare under that. Because uh, we've had hospital closings, other sorts of issues, because and lots of debate about Medicaid expansion as well as Medicare for all, single payer. Okay. Well, you know, Kansas has a very progressive history, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, I remember, you yeah. know, my my grandparents lived in Missouri, and I remember one time, um, one time I, I went to visit my grandparents, and we drove over into Kansas to visit John Brown's house, uh, which is a museum, and he's a, a hero in Kansas. You got that beautiful painting. Uh, in your state capitol building of John Brown holding up his rifle in the Bible. You know, that's a, just a beautiful work. Um, and uh, also, um, I, I, from what I understand, Earl Browder, who was the chairman of the Communist Party uh, for many years during the 1930s, during the Roosevelt administration, and was a key ally of the Roosevelt administration, he was from Kansas, and he actually ran, his nickname was The Man from Kansas. And they even had a campaign song for him when he would run as presidential candidate for the Communist Party, calling him The Man from Kansas. Um, and it's really weird how politics has shifted because you get the idea, you know, going back to the populists uh, and the free soilers and the abolitionist movement up into the time of Eugene Debs. Uh, Kansas was associated with a very, very radical politics. I know there's that book that's been very popular among kind of progressives and liberals called What's the Matter with Kansas? Why is it that Kansas is now considered a red state when it has such a progressive, anti-racist, anti-slavery, pro-socialist history? I think it's several things like uh, the massive socialist movement. Um, I think it's both a problem with the politics in America generally and with uh, subsequent socialist movements. Uh, like back at the time, it was they were out like working with farmers to form cooperatives to protect them against these like radical price fluctuations and uh and they were organizing miners against exploitative mining industries. Um, of course, during the world, the first world war uh, was like a big hit towards so like where you see a lot of the activism and things go down. I, I believe the Appeal to Reason, which was one of the biggest um, socialist publications uh, ever in the United States coming out of Kansas. 
closed in the 20, maybe? And so, um, but then, like, a lot of the revival of left politics has been a very urban intellectual phenomenon. It's been lots of people go to school and they're studying and uh, wanting to deal with, like, race issues and things like that, which, of course, is extremely important. Um, but they just have been uh, very separated for rural areas and like sort of have bought into a lot of the propaganda about them to what small town rural people sort of it's up to their imaginations to see like what's uh like why are minority uh poor communities and cities the way they are and how did they get there and what's it going to take for them to get better and they're very dependent on representations and so they have all these ideas based on media but similarly you have people in cities like oh backwards inbred redneck hicks this and that and um there's just not a lot of like concerted effort to be organizing in those areas and so it's like for several decades um i mean i i talked to a democratic uh i don't remember senator or house representative in kansas about this senate election he's like well as democrats we only need 10 counties out of 105 counties in kansas to win so you know who cares about all those real people basically and it's like that's you're problem like decade after decade you just ignore them we don't need them to win these elections or something and so of course like the people who are spending time with them and are listening to them are going to get their votes even if it's like um and they feel the same as like people in cities do like we vote lesser of evils like politicians are overwhelmingly corrupt and all these things it's not like all of them just uh, believe the Republican Party leadership is just the per- perfect representation of their ideals. Uh, let, so I think. Let me ask you. Um, uh, you know, uh, I I'm also curious. Um, are you a person of faith, and uh, does your faith influence your politics? Let's see. I would say relationship status complicated. Okay. <laughs> it's complicated. Um, I definitely grew up extremely devout and was planning on being a minister and did uh, several like um, extended volunteer mission trips, like both doing work in South Africa and in Croatia as well. Um, I did and almost finished a master's at seminary uh, before dropping i think over time i kind of uh just got more and more interested in the broader social issues and like okay just dealing with these individual moral actions doesn't address like huge global like distributions of uh wealth and poverty and um and so just kind of like well I don't know. I don't. There's. I don't feel like I can know about all of what all the invisible things. I want to do the good work that I do know about, and so um, I don't know. I. I guess I. Are you still there? You're frozen I'm, on my end. Yeah, the connection's pretty bad. I hope the video comes out okay. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I find it very fascinating. Is there a lot of enthusiasm about your campaign? Do you have a good crew of people that are dedicated to getting you elected? <sighs> Had a decent, it is, it has been very hard with the quarantine, I will say. Uh, don't have like quite the funds to push all of the, the uh, advertising, but I can't be meeting with tons of people. So we're doing what I can, what we can and hoping that, uh, like, especially as uh, Biden got the nomination, a lot of socialists and lefties are pretty upset about the uh, Democratic Party. I've been getting a lot more interest in saying, like, OK, let's see what's going on over here. Um, and so uh, hoping, like, as we reach out and gain more momentum and help from that, um, and then because I'm running in a primary versus five people with basically identical platforms. It's like, I'm the most Trumpian Republican that uh, they'll split the vote and we can kind of 
start building a movement of different type of Republicans that uh, a populist movement, but one that's in solidarity with immigrants instead of scapegoating them. <coughs> Kobach. Um, uh, now, do you think you'll be allowed on the debate stage with the other candidates? No, <laughs> I have been shut out so far. So um, I will, I would have to be, uh, grow quite a bit. I, I, they will do everything in their power to not give me any sort of platform. They've made that quite clear. So um, some local uh, Republican chapters have had me, but um, the party itself has been pretty uh, decided against like giving me any sort of platform. Well, it's odd because the Republican Party, when it began, is far more in line with with your views than with the the current leadership. I mean, Karl Marx endorsed the Republicans in the 1864 presidential election, right? I mean, <laughs> Abraham Lincoln had a communist general in the Union Army named August Willick. Um, you know, so uh, you know, I mean, your views. I mean, the, the Republican Party is the party of free land, free labor, free men, right? I mean, it, it's a populist working class party, right? They should yeah. be all about what you're about if they're about their roots. When it started in Nebraska, not too far from Kansas. So, um, you know, it's a shame that you're being locked out. Do you have a strategy for, for making them recognize you and making them not uh, not push you into the margins? Uh, yeah, we've been working with kind of uh, third party organizations like that advocate health care or other sorts of things to host issue based debates. Uh, so that if it's like mental health uh, organizations want to have a debate, like what are you going to do for the mental health community? And um, if my opponents don't show up, then because they don't care about that, then <laughs> that looks bad on them and still gives me a platform. If they do, then I feel like I'm just from the policy. And uh, so it is my hope that getting some of these organizations will bring forth some of the issues and let Kansas voters hear, uh, hear the different options and actually make a decision based on it rather than based on party leaders suppressing whose views get to be brought forward. Great. Well, um, now tell me, um, I mean, how has your campaign affected your, your family and your loved ones? Are they, uh, are they nervous about having a, uh, a public socialist figure living in their household or, or being associated with them? Is it, is it affecting your, your family and next of kin, or are they happy to, happy to see you, you know, throwing your hat into the ring? Oh, I think they're, uh, mostly pretty supportive and happy. It hasn't affected them too much, uh, as of yet in terms of like, uh, we'll have to grow some more before, uh, you know, we get more like hate mail or whatever, <laughs> but, um, but for the most part, like some of my extended family members, are, oh, I kind of get where you're coming from, but socialist, uh, 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 um, <laughs> but overall my family's been very supportive. Like, um, I asked my mom, like, will you endorse me? And she said, I'll always endorse you, Brian. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. So. Yeah. Thanks, Mom. Well, very good. Um, I mean, any anything else that'll be central to your campaign? Um, any any other issue that's very important in your in your state? Um, the main thing I think, other than the economy and healthcare, is immigration. Just because uh, Chris Kobach is running, and he's one of the most anti-immigrant uh, politicians in the country, and. Uh, and then the Democratic frontrunner has, as of yet, not mentioned immigration at all, trying to just avoid it. So that's something I'm trying to bring forward uh, because it's actually an issue. A lot of farmers want, uh, want there to be immigration because they require immigrant labor. But also, um, I think there's just a different way to view it that isn't based on scarcity, like especially if we have a job guarantee and emphasizing like, look, these people can come and help build a better Kansas with us. Like we, it's not like there are a finite number of jobs and it's us or them, or uh, it's like they could be, one of my friends is a, a DACA recipient and she tried to go to med school, but could not because of her status. And it's like, they 
it could be providing healthcare, not just taking healthcare. They can be uh, producing things and like participating to create a really awesome Kansas. And I um, like my parents were pro-immigrant Republicans. And so I think uh, especially some people in uh, faith communities and things like that, they have a much more humanist and like understanding. Like I, I did an interview with my mom and she said, like, I know if I was in and I thought if I could get across the border, my kids could have a better future. Like, of course I would do it. I would take any risk for them. Um, and so I hope that there are a lot of people who uh, have a more hospitable uh, outreach. And I um, that's been my experience when meeting Kansans is that there are a lot of people who do uh, want that. So that's something I care about and want to keep emphasizing. Well, thanks, Brian. Um, I really, really appreciate you talking to us. I'm going to post this interview on YouTube. It's been a very interesting conversation. And I'll be following the news about your campaign as the election draws nearer. It sounds very, very interesting. Uh, a socialist Republican from Kansas. Uh, not, not the normal uh, discourse in American politics, but it may be the wave of the future, in my view, right? We may be seeing a revival of populism and socialism in the heartland of the country. So thanks for talking to us, Brian. All my Absolutely. best. Absolutely. Thanks.